Next we have Sophia, and she has an amazing testimony to share, full of trials and victories. She has been a speaker at several other churches in the area. She has lived in TO since she was a teenager, and she is married, and she has a two-year-old son. She works full-time, and she's also involved in the women's ministry. I mean, this lady does it all. <laughs> And heads up again for you moms about the MOPS program because she is one of um, the ladies that's involved with it. So we are excited to, to have that at the bridge too. So please welcome Sophia. Well, it's a joy to be here this evening. I want to thank, first and foremost, the events team and Barbara for um, asking me to speak. I'm humbled, and it's just a privilege to be able to share with all you ladies tonight. Gosh, as I stand up here, I'm just taken back by the beauty of this room and all of you ladies here. You look beautiful. Um, this is such a special time of year. It's a time filled with so many memories, and I just love it. The lights, the sights, the sounds, the smells. It brings up a lot of memories for me. And in fact, the first time I ever stood on stage to ever um, was at Christmas time. I was in grade school, and um, my teacher asked me to play the part of the angel. And it was my job to recite, memorize and recite Luke chapter 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He's Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign unto you. You will find the baby wrapped in, in clothes, lying in a manger. There's something precious, tender, vulnerable about a newborn baby. It's a human experience that tugs at everyone's heart, especially if you're a mama. It's amazing that this is how the father chose to send his son to us. Tonight, part of my testimony will be about my babies and how they were sent to me. Hold on one sec. All right, I'm going to roll with this. <laughs> Before I start, I want to share that some of the things in my story tonight are things that I'm still very much working through in my own life. But with each passing day, um, God is bringing me closer to a place of healing in Isaiah 63, 1, it says, To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. I know this passage to be true in my life as he continues to reveal himself to me in my personal journey of sanctification. And it's my prayer that despite the weight of my story, you can see God's sovereign hand walking with me every step of the way. And just as he's given me the ability to be joyful in hope, may he impart the same gift of you regardless of any trials you may be facing. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, we come before you this evening and we're just so thankful, Lord. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the, the hands that prepared it, Lord. Dear God, will you just, will you manifest and speak through me? Thank you for your word. Thank you for all you've done, God. Amen. I'm a woman who's known Jesus my whole life. I grew up in a wonderful Christian family with two parents who love the Lord and seek to serve him in everything that they did. I remember being very young and just loving him deeply with my whole heart and believing that God was who he says he is. 
My parents would say that I was a joy-filled, happy little girl who loved to sing. However, when I was about six years old, an ugly event happened in my life that greatly affected me, and it twisted some of my views about God. Thankfully, I don't have a detailed memory of the event, but one day while playing at a neighbor's house, her older brother sexually abused me. Just like that, my innocence was robbed. Curiously enough, God blocked out that horrible memory until I was about 27 years old. But as a result of that event, I allowed my subconscious to subconsciously believe lies about God and who he is. I grew up in a church. I went to private Christian school. I attended Awanas, summer camps, Sunday school, through all of which I gained a ton of head knowledge about God. But even so, I still allowed the horrible acts that had been done to me to pollute my latent psyche and deteriorate my trust in God. Psalm 37, 3 through 4 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is one of the many promises God tells us in his word, that if we just delight in the Lord and trust in him to lead us regardless of what happens and obey him, we will enjoy safe pastures and the desires of our heart will be given to us. Even though I knew this inherent truth about God, because of what happened to me, I chose to not take him at his word. I chose to believe the lie that the God of the universe was too big to be burdened with my hurts, and that I was insignificant to him. That's why he didn't protect me. And if I could not trust God, then who could I trust? These lies were the beginning of my lost joy and becoming a fear-filled girl who needed to control her life so she could feel safe. When I was 13, I accepted Jesus as my savior. I still remember the light night clearly as it had been the crescendo of a particularly hard month in my life. I had lost two friends to an automobile accident in the same week and one of my favorite teachers a few weeks later. I was lying in bed crying and my mom came in to comfort me. I told her how miserable I was and I didn't understand why so many things that I held dear were being taken from me. My mom explains that we aren't promised an easy road in this life, but because of Christ's perfect sacrifice and resurrection of our hope, that our hope does not lie in this world. It was in glory with him. And at that point, my mom looked me in the eye and asked me if I thought that I had truly accepted Jesus as my savior before. I had prayed a prayer as a young child, but really I didn't know. She asked if um, I wanted to receive Christ's gift and have the Holy Spirit come upon me and be filled in a way that I'd never been before. So she led me through a prayer of salvation and during that prayer, I did feel the Holy Spirit come upon me, and I was instantly filled. But even after that, as a young teen, much like Shelby, I still looked at my faith as something that I could control, like a math equation. I thought that if I did X, Y, and Z, it would equal a deeper relationship with God. I now realize that this was part of me operating out of my fear. I believed everything that was written about Jesus and who he is, but I still didn't believe that all of his promises applied to me. I still didn't believe that I was worthy enough to be counted as his child, even though I knew that by default he had to count me as his child because I prayed a prayer. I overcompensated and I tried to control things to make up for the fact that I viewed myself as lacking. I built up walls, I created sin holds around me, I surrendered to the chains of perfectionism, self-contempt, an eating disorder, the desire to be loved and accepted. I now realize that 
God was my savior, but I had not made him Lord of my life. And I slid any chance I had of a relationship with him into the back seat while I tried to clutch on to the wheel of control over my life. And in doing so, I fell into a perpetual sin cycle. I'd be walking with God for a while, and then I would falter and end up chasing after the ways of the world in an intent to find happiness. And in the process, I would end up partying, chasing empty relationships with men, lashing out at friends and family in anger. Every time I did this, I would always come back to God crying and asking for forgiveness. Even though I knew, I knew that God was the only one who could truly bring me joy and freedom from the emotional chains that enslaved me. But I was still allured by the cheap substitutes of happiness that the world offers. Perhaps you can relate to that. I'm ashamed to admit how long I continued the cycle of self-loathing and and destruction in my life. How long I allowed my faith to sit in that back seat. How long I grasped at the threads of truth that were shrouded in the lies that told me that I could have joy, peace, and freedom if I just accepted Jesus but didn't allow my will to completely align to his. This continued on for many years. But despite that, during this time, God allowed something amazing to happen in my life. I met my husband, Jeff. And through the events of meeting Jeff, I can again see that God's hand was in it all, And I've also come to know that God has a sense of humor. Because everything I told God that I didn't want to happen when meeting my husband happened with Jeff. I said I'd never meet my husband in a bar. I met him in a pub. I said I'd never marry someone under six feet. Jeff is 5'10". Thank God he's still taller than me, so thank God for that. Um, I said I'd never marry an Italian. Um, My last name is now D. Domenico. So uh, what's that saying? Never say never. God has made me eat my words more than a few times, but it's always purposeful. And through it, he's blessed me with an incredible man who loves Jesus. So, so much for trying to control things. Within nine months of being married, I became pregnant. Both Jeff and I were elated at this. Being pregnant for me in and of itself was an answer to prayer. Because of severe endometriosis and some other medical conditions, doctors were unsure if I'd even be able to get pregnant on my own. But I was. We rejoiced when we found out, and that same night, we dedicated our baby to God. We surrendered the baby into his loving care and will as he saw fit. We prayed for protection over the baby and as it was being knit together in my womb. My pregnancy was by all means typical. I spent the first 15 weeks fatigued, emotional, practically hugging the toilet all day long. The baby's heartbeat was strong and it was growing at a normal rate according to every ultrasound. At 12 weeks gestation, my doctor gave us the option of submitting to some of the first trimester screening tests. She said the results would give us a better outlook on the baby's future. If it was not favorable, we would have the option to terminate. I had originally said yes, thinking that knowing of any abnormalities ahead of time would be a good thing, but God soon placed on both Jeff and my heart that testing was unnecessary. Upon telling my doctor, she smiled. She was in support of us. The big test was at 20 weeks anyways. And that 20 weeks came quicker than I expected. I was finally over the nausea and my weight gain was right on track. My doctor assured me that I was doing everything in my power to plan for ideal conditions for my baby. So Jeff and I, like many people, planned. We tried to plan out what our ideas of parenting this baby would be. We talked baby names, parenting rules, sleep training. 
We eagerly awaited our second trimester ultrasound and met that ultrasound with joyous tears as we saw our child's face for the first time. We were told that all of the parts were sizing within normal range and correctly, and there was only one exception to this. The ultrasound technician could not get a good view of the baby's left foot. She said she was sending us to a specialist to rule out the possibility of a club foot, but we shouldn't be alarmed. We weren't alarmed by the possibility of a club foot. So three weeks later, Jeff and I arrived at the specialist's office. We expected that everything would be fine and would be shortly on our way back to work. In fact, we were relaxed throughout the whole screening, just enjoying watching our baby on the screen. The test finally took a sobering turn when the technicians abruptly stopped the test and left the room. The doctor came in and introduced himself and began the test all over again. We were a little taken back by this. Why was the doctor going over everything the tech had just measured? After 15 minutes, the doctor stopped the test. Here's what I'm seeing, he said. The baby's left foot does look clubbed, but it's not just that. It looks as though it has a small chin, and I might be seeing a slight heart defect, but I won't know until you meet with my pediatric cardiologist that I have here on staff. It's my advice that at this time you do an amnio. Jeff and I were sh in shock, and without much thinking, we performed that amnio. Even in that action, I can now see God's sovereign hand. The doctor told us that we needed to meet with a genetic counselor that day. In that appointment, we were told that the abnormalities our baby was showing were slight, and the odds were telling her that if anything, it was trisomy 21 Down syndrome. To hear all this felt like someone had kicked me in the chest. I couldn't breathe. Jeff and I were young and fairly healthy. Down syndrome is something that we never imagined. At that time, we lost it. We did the only thing we could think of doing. We got on our knees and we cried out to God. We prayed that he would be merciful to our child and would grant us his peace that surpasses all understanding. We poured out our hearts to him and told us that we didn't know what to do but we were going to trust him to lead us on this path. Most of all, we pleaded. We pleaded with God to heal our beloved baby because we knew that he was the only one that could. We spent the next 10 days in constant prayer as we waited for the results. And in the end, Jeff and I had resolved our hearts to the fact that raising a special needs child was a big possibility. Although it wasn't the future we had anticipated, we were at peace about it. So when we received the call from the genetic counselor and were told that our baby had trisomy 18, Jeff and I were caught off guard. Neither of us had ever heard of trisomy 18. She told us that unfortunately, there's not much known other than that it's a rather rare genetic abnormality and con especially considering our ages. She said she didn't discuss it at the appointment because it was such a rarity. Then the most chilling words I have ever heard in my life followed suit. Of what we do know, I'm sorry to tell you that it's not a matter of if your child is going to die, it's a matter of when. At that statement, Jeff and I were silent on the phone. Neither of us could speak. The counselor then told us that she would be there if we had any further questions. She then said, I understand you weren't going to find out the sex of the baby. In light of the circumstances, would you like to know? I was able to squeak out a yes she told us we were having a baby boy. God had given us, but more specifically my husband, the deepest desires of our hearts, a son. And he was going to allow him to be taken away from us. 
At all of this, I found myself unable to move, unable to speak, unable to breathe, and I collapsed on the floor. Laying in a fetal position in our office, I cried out the only word I could think over and over again, Jesus. It took me weeks before I could face the outside world again. And when I did, we were faced with the reality of our situation. The doctors gave us less than a 5% chance that my son would not die abruptly inside me. We were also given a 2% chance that my body would actually carry this baby to full term. And even if he was alive during the birthing process, a less than 1% chance that he would actually take a breath outside of my womb. With much prayer, lamenting, and tears, Jeff and I decided that this would be our time to parent our son. The first thing we needed to do was to decide on a name. This was a big decision. There's a lot to a name. Matthew 1, 21, the angel Gabriel told Joseph and Mary, he was, told Joseph that Mary was going to give birth to a son and that he was to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. As we prayed about it, Jeff and I believed that we were also divinely given a name, a name in which Jeff and I had never considered or even liked before giving, being given to us. But it was the only name that resounded over and over again to both of us. And in our obedience, we named our son after the same angel who brought Mary and Joseph the joyous news that the Savior was to be born. We named our son Gabriel. We did not know its meaning at the time, but we later came to find out that Gabriel means God is my strength. And I cannot think of a more appropriate name as God was the only reason that we were able to pull ourselves out of bed every single day. I'm sure, as you can imagine, that after Gabriel's diagnosis, we were advised by every doctor countless times to terminate. They would say things to us like, this is too painful to go through. Why don't you just get it off, pull off the Band-Aid? Or why don't you just terminate and get pregnant again really quickly? I'm sure on the next time you'll have a real baby. No. Jeff and I would resound, no. Our blatant injections would always leave doctors to then ask why. And in a very pragmatic and simplistic way, we would explain. We told them that we believe that every life has a plan and a purpose, that God values every life, and that he has every one of our days numbered. And we believe that it was up to him to decide when that life was done here on earth. Funny enough, Jeff and I did not realize it, but with every answer we gave, we were boldly sharing our faith. To be honest, I'm glad I didn't realize it, because I'm sure if I had put much thought into it, I would have buckled under the pressure. We knew our decision didn't make sense to the world, but we knew it was the right decision. In this situation, I felt like we only had two choices. We either choose the way of the world, and end our suffering quickly, which did make sense to us. But in that, we knew we would carry the consequence of our disobedience. Or we choose to blindly abandon ourselves and follow him. Termination was not an option if we were choosing to follow God in this valley. So we walked forward in obedience and faith, leaning on God for everything. I realize that there might be women here tonight who have been faced with a difficult pregnancy situation and did not choose the same path that my husband and I did. I just want to let you know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He, if you've chosen him as your savior, he bore the eternal consequences for you. And take heart that although you live with the actions and the consequences here on earth, your child's in glory with him. He's being taken care of by our Heavenly Father, and he's, they're waiting for you. Before I could blink, 40 weeks had passed, 
and it was time for Gabriel to be born. I awaited that day with a mixture of emotions. I was absolutely terrified, but I remained hopeful that if God chose to do a miracle, he could. He could heal my son. And we kept praying for that miracle. As we entered the hospital, both Jeff and I were surrounded by a heavenly peace. We had to rock this road. Although we knew it was treacherous, we weren't walking it alone. Gabriel Louis DiDomenico was born February 10th, 2012, at exactly 10.03 a.m., and God gave us the greatest gift I could have ever imagined to be given. We had time with our son. To this day, I can still feel his little head right here on my chest. We loved on him for 41 minutes, and we told him that although we loved him, we released him into God's arms. We told him that it was all right to go to Jesus. At exactly 10.44 a.m., from my arms, he did just that. God's loving hand orchestrated that entire birth. Gabriel, at the astonishment of doctors and nurses, beat every single odd. He was born alive. And because of those amnio results, which allowed us to develop a birth plan ahead of time, Gabriel spent every minute of his life in Jeff and my embrace. Losing Gabriel was the hardest thing I've ever walked through at that point. It ripped my heart out with the amount of pain we endured, but despite that heartache, I experienced joy and peace that are indescribable and surpass common understanding. And I want to add that I do believe that God answered our prayers for healing. He just didn't do it in the way I thought. Just four months after Gabriel, another miracle happened. I was pregnant again. We proceeded into this pregnancy much different than in our first, as in we were extremely cautious. Because Gabriel had trisomy 18, we were told that we needed all the first trimester testing to rule out any chromosomal abnormalities. And that first trimester testing included a nuchal translucency test, where they do an ultrasound to measure the fluid at the back of the baby's neck and then draw a blood panel. I remember thinking to myself, God, you wouldn't allow this again, would you? The day we got the test results back, I couldn't breathe. The results came back that this baby, too, had a high probability of a chromosomal abnormality, such as trisomy 18. The doctors, ad again, advised us to terminate this pregnancy. It was like someone had just, again, kicked the bruise in my gut that was just beginning to soften. But this time, Jeff and my countenance was different. We rejected that diagnosis, and we got on our knees, and we prayed for a miracle. And many of you here joined us in those prayers, for which Jeff and I are so thankful. And on April 19th, 2013, Maximus John DiDomenico was born, weighing 7 pounds, 9 ounces, 19 and a half inches long, and perfectly healthy. Our Maximus is now two and a half years old, and he's a living miracle. Psalm 127, 3 through 4, David writes, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in the warrior's hands. And Maximus is just that. He's full of joy and he loves to sing. In all honesty, I wish I could stop my story right here. We walked through the valley of the shadow of death with Gabriel and ascended the mountain peaks with Maximus. But Jesus in John 16:33 said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. More trials were to come, 
again teaching me that I had little to no control over my own life. When Maximus was eight months old, I conceived again. The pregnancy was progressing normally, and the baby was growing perfectly. Jeff and I assumed we had another miracle baby on the way. But our world was once again shaken when the, we went into the specialist office for that halfway ultrasound and discovered that our baby girl had suddenly passed away. To worsen the matter, I had not gone into preterm labor, and my body continued to hold on to her. So I was forced to go to the one place in the world that I earlier refused to go, an abortion clinic. The surgery I had to have was so complex that there are actually only four doctors in the entire state that can perform it. Although I was overwhelmed with sorrow, I knew my impending appointment with this doctor was no coincidence. What the enemy had intended to use to rob me of my joy, God was going to redeem. So Jeff and I prayed. We prayed that in the midst of our grief, we could somehow be a light to anyone we encountered there. I felt like Jonah being sent to the one place in the world I detested the most to carry out the message of God's grace. I don't know exactly all God did while we were there, but I do know he did something. Because when that doctor called to tell us that the testing on our daughter had come back and everything was normal, that there was no explainable reason that my daughter should have passed away, and I thanked her. I thanked her for her skilled hands and taking care of my baby. That stoic, unbelieving doctor whom we originally met was beside herself with grief and sorrow. Since losing our daughter, I've lost two more babies, two little boys, one at four months and one at almost six. And because I once again lost both of my babies in the second trimester and I didn't miscarry, I had to have another surgery or two. And I subsequently met and prayed for the other abortion doctor who performs these kinds of things in Los Angeles. There's a famous author by the name of Jerry Sitzer. His breakout book, A Grace Disguise, was written as a reflection of his own loss experience. In the introduction, he writes a passage that has just always stuck with me. He writes, as I reflect on the story of my own loss, I have learned that though entirely unique as all losses are, it is, man it is a manifestation of a universal experience. Sooner or later, all people suffer loss, in little doses or big ones, suddenly or over time, privately or in the public setting. Loss is as much a part of normal life as birth. For as surely as we are born into this world, we will suffer loss. It is not, therefore, the experience of loss that becomes the defining moment of our lives. It's how we respond to that loss that matters. The response will largely determine the quality, the direction, and the impact of our lives. Even through the grief and the ripping of my heart, I choose to praise God. Even through the windstorm of uncertainties and the rolling waves of emotions, I choose to keep my eyes fixed on him who paid the price for my sin. I choose this because I know. Are we okay? No? Wait, no? Okay. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> that was God. <laughs> the booming voice. I walk forward 
in certainty that God will live up to his promises because his grace is sufficient and his love never fails. A verse that has brought me so much comfort during this season is James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so you will be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. This testing has been the hardest thing that I had ever had to face. But through it all, I've developed the most beautiful, intimate, deep, personal relationship with my Lord. And he's also allowed the trials of my adulthood to free me from the, child, the trials of my childhood. Today, Jeff and I are choosing to be obedient to God in a new thing he's calling us to. We're currently training through Arrow Family Services to be foster to adopt parents. It's honestly a place I don't know that we would have ever arrived unless we had walked through everything we did. And at times, it's difficult to think about the uncertainty that lies ahead. But we're trusting God and his plan to build our family. I also believe that God is redeeming the hurts of my childhood, that I'll be better able to comfort children who have also been hurt. And frankly, if Christian families like Jeff and I don't step up and take in the orphans as Jesus commanded, who is? Lastly, I still have hope to grow our family biologically. One of my biggest prayers to God through this season was human answers to why we've lost three babies for unknown causes. And he so mercifully answered that request. And although it won't be a simple process, it's something treatable. So to tie this back to our verse of the evening, Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. I want to say that joy is first and foremost a choice. You choose to be joyful regardless of your feelings, regardless of your circumstance. People often confuse joy with happiness. Joy isn't happiness, as happiness is a temporary thing. Happiness is a feeling. And to quote my friend Sylvia, our feelings can often be devoid of truth. But joy, joy is the reassurance of expectation of hope that never fades despite the circumstance of our life. There's no other way to find joy, patience, peace among the heartaches and trials of our lives than Jesus. If you don't have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, then you will never truly find it. You will stumble around, grasping at the threads of truth amidst the lies, and you'll experience happiness for a while, but you'll continue to be back, brought back to the place of empty after that high fades. I say that in love because I lived it. Perhaps you have. If you haven't made the decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to do so tonight. Repent of your sin, and then as it says in Romans 10, 9, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, and you'll be saved. I also want to share that the way to be patient in affliction is to be faithful in prayer. Don't give up. For Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, suffering develops perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope, hope does not disappoint. How we come before our Father is through prayer. The Lord knows what you're going through, but he wants you to come before him and ask for his help. So I encourage you, whatever you're walking through, 
whether it be difficult or wonderful, take it to him. In a gathering of this size, I know that there are many of you going through your own difficult trials. Either you or a loved one, you might be struggling through in suffering or pain. You may be experiencing loss, loss of a child, loss of a parent, loss of a spouse, a marriage, a job. Or perhaps you live through a deep pain and this holiday season just tends to kick that bruise that you're able to ignore the rest of the year. I want you to know God loves you and your loved ones, that he's with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he is for you, he's not against you, that he works all things for good, all things, even the hard ones, even the painful ones. Do you know this? Do you know him? It's the exact reason Jesus came to bring us salvation and hope. Through all of this, God has now brought me back to a place where I'm able to sing again. So in closing, I want to sing for you what has become one of the deepest prayers of my heart. And I hope that as you listen to the words, it'll minister to yours as well and help you regardless of what you're facing, to be joyful in hope.